You're gaining electricity now because the plug came to you instead of you going to the plug. And I am so grateful that there is that type of God in this universe. Left to my own devices, I would have never gone to the electricity. I was sharing yesterday, real quick before we go into the sermon, my niece, she, she, she said, raise your hand. Cherise graduated from college a couple months ago. And we had a cookout or whatever for her yesterday to celebrate her accomplishment and what God has done and is doing in her life. And, and while I was there, I, I caught up with people I haven't seen in some in a long time. And uh, we were just talking, as people do, reminiscing about whatever. And I was sharing, and, and the, the friend was talking to me about Kurt and I. Kurt, raise your hand. Kurt and I, how many remember in February I went down and during the snowstorm I had to go to a wedding? That's the young man that got married. And um, he and I have been friends since <coughs> we were kids. And so I, I was, the person brought up to me about me and Kurt and different others and, and what, some of the stuff we used to do and where we were. And as I was thinking, I was realizing, wow, for that person, that's, that's how that person sees me. That person still sees me. 20 years ago. And so I, I spent the next few minutes trying and trying to bring that person up to where I am now. Because I didn't want to not see that person for a while. And his last impression of me was 1991. And since 89, 91, the plug came to me. The transformation that God makes in our lives is not because of us, it's because of Him. It's in spite of us. So today, I just more briefly want to talk from Luke 15. I need you to go to Luke 15 with me. I'm not going to keep you too long because the chicken is cooking at the Dickens' house. And I, 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 don't, I don't want dried out chicken. So I can't keep it too long because we got to get to the ribs of chicken. Amen. 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 Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 1. Wait till you get there. It's okay. I'm going to read it out of the uh, TNIV, but if you got the King James or whatever version, it will all follow. Trust me. Luke 15, if we got to say amen. amen. Luke 15, starting at verse 1, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. This man welcomed sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose the woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a, can a lamp? sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let us pray. Father, into your presence we stand and we sit. Into your presence you've gathered us that we might know you. That we might even know by knowing you know ourselves. And that after we know ourselves, we might be able to do something by you, through you, that will change 
the community and the environment with which we live. We thank you for loving us enough to bring us out here this morning. Now by your spirit, do something that's unique. Do something that's totally unlike anything else except by you. And do something that will last as only you can because you're eternal. That will last in our lives until you call us home. That will forever change us and help change others. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Your son. Amen. amen. The Pharisees and the teachers are muttering. First off, look who's gathered to hear Jesus. It's not the Pharisees and the teachers. <laughs> it's the sinners and the tax collectors. Now, I ain't got time to get into all this. The tax collectors are basically put into the same lump as the sinners because according to the Jews, the tax collectors were almost worse than sinners because the tax collectors were taking in money for Rome from the Jews. So they were considered, in many cases, equal or not worse than sinners. And the people that are gathering around Jesus are tax collectors and sinners. The Pharisees are there not to hear Jesus. You notice what it says. Keep your Bible open and you stay in the text. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around. Why? To hear Jesus. But the others are there that they may mutter. Their muttering is what triggers these three parables. And, and we don't have time to go over all the parables today. I'm going to kind of lightly touch on the first two. The third of which you've heard me preach many times. The prodigal son. But the first two are the lost sheep. The lost coin. And then the third one is the lost son. In, in every case, Jesus is preaching this parable or teaching this parable not because the tax collectors and sinners have gathered. He's really not even teaching it as much for them. He's teaching for the ones that are muttering. Y'all need to pay attention. Amen. Listen to me. Amen. You know why? Because the ones that are muttering are self-righteous. See, the sinners and the tax collectors know they're sinners, and they know they're tax collectors. They know they're lost. They know they're, whispers used to say, lost and turned out. They know they have no place in society. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law think they have arrived. And so they're muttering because they know Jesus is attracting a crowd that should not be attracted by a righteous man. I need to ask you a question today. Don't raise your hand. Don't even look at me. I'll look at the ceiling. Who are you attracting? Are you attracting folk that only believe what you think you say and believe? Or are you attracting those that know they're lost and turned out? But want to come to you because you've got something to offer that they don't have. Amen. If you come to church and leave church and you're an untouchable, that's a problem. If you can quote scripture but you can't lend a hand, the parables show us the grace of God. And they not only show us the grace of God in how it changes us individually. We all get that. But it shows us the grace of God and how it changes community. See, Jesus' whole goal was to come into the earth and create a community that was totally different. Is this going in and out? His whole goal was to create a community that would allow us to see something totally unique, totally new, totally energized. Something that was unlike anything you've seen in this world. Now, in order to do that community, that means you have to invite people in that were not once welcome. Did I tell you the name of the sermon? It's All Are Welcome. So briefly, we're going to look at the sheep, the search, and the shepherd. The sheep, the search, and the shepherd. We're going to see how in each of these three, God creates a community out of grace. The sheep. First off, when God calls... If you're saved, you said you had your hands up, those who are saved. If he calls you sheep, it's, it's really not a compliment. Because sheep are not the wisest creatures that God ever made. They are easily distracted. They're very gullible. And they live for the moment. They, they, they are totally obscured to danger and peril. If they see something they want, they go right after it. And that's why the shepherd has to be a very good shepherd in order to keep a flock together. Uh, when a sheep gets lost, the only way it can be found or the only way it can be brought back to the fold 
See, sheep are not like cats and dogs. You know, if you have a dog, you can kind of find it. Say, oh. And it sees you and it runs. It wags its tail and it usually runs. Or even a cat, which are very independent. But even a cat, it'll find its way home. Sheep can't find their way home. And even when they see you, because of their mentality and because of their personality, they run to and fro. They'll never, you can't say, come here. Come here. What you got to do is you got to go get it. You got to throw it down. You got to tie its four legs and its hind legs. You got to put it up over your shoulder and you got to carry it home or you'll never get it back. You got to carry the sheep all the way home because once the sheep is lost, it'll stay lost unless you do something to bring it back. So when God calls you sheep, that's not really the greatest of compliments. But there's a reason why he calls us sheep. Because the only way he can save us is to grab us, throw us down, tie us up, put us over his shoulder, and carry us home. If you made it into the kingdom, God threw you down. Because you're not a cat or dog. He whistled and used to right there. He had to come get you. Yes, The Bible teaches us two things about sheep. We'll be keep it moving. It teaches us that one, as sheep, we need to be rescued constantly. Yes. Sheep are like this. If sheep are walking down this little aisle right here, and they <laughs> see grass over here, they will instantly leave that aisle. And go to the grass. Now, there could be a pack of wolves over there, but they're not the wisest. They will still go to that grass. It can be on a steep incline. They will climb and make their way up the incline to get the grass, but once they're up there, they don't know how to get down. Or they're so close to the to the steep to, uh, to the to the edge, they might plunge to their death. They are so distracted. By wanting the grass, by feeding on the grass, that they've lost their way. Somebody needs to pray with me. Amen. God calls you sheep. Amen. The Bible says that, that we, like all sheep, have gone astray. That's Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. The Bible lets us know that we are very short-sighted, short-minded. See... If you're feeding on some grass other than Jesus, sooner or later the grass is either going to dry up or you're going to eat it all up. And then you're going to find yourself in peril between the wolves and the steep incline to which either you're going to emotionally and spiritually fall to your death or be eaten up by the very thing that attracted you to it. The only thing you can eat that one will never put you in danger and two will never wither away or dry up is Jesus. Amen. So what happens is, he says, we're sheep because our souls are feeding usually on something that won't last and that puts us in peril's way. I need you to see today that all are welcome into the kingdom because the kingdom has the place of pasture where you can eat and be fed and never be in peril. Amen. It is the only place. If there's someone or something that you're more concerned with than your shepherd, you're on a steep slope, and you got nowhere to go. Be very, very careful, because that means if he doesn't come and rescue you, you won't make your way home. You can't. It's not your nature. It's not your nature if you're unsaved, and if you're saved, he's constantly got to come and rescue you. See, I'm not saying you've lost your salvation. I'm saying even after following him as shepherd, you tend to And if he doesn't come and get you Don't look at me How many know somebody that started And you look at them and you say They can't get 
unless he comes and gets them. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes, Not only does it teach that we need rescue constantly, the Bible teaches us how thoroughly we need to be rescued. Because we're not cats and dogs, we won't follow him. He can't whistle and we come back. The essence of who Jesus is is not that he's just a teacher. Jesus didn't come just to teach us the way. Listen to me. He did that. But he didn't. See, see, every other religion except Christianity treats you like a dog or a cat. It does. I'm not putting it up. This is true. It says, listen, let me give you pointers. Let me give you some word or let me give you some doctrine. You'll pick it up and you'll walk with it. You'll be the dog or the cat. I'll show you the way and you'll remember how to get back. Christianity says, no, you're not a dog or a cat. You're sheep. You don't know how to get back. So Jesus didn't come just to teach. Jesus came to be the shepherd. He came to be the Savior because God knew I can't just... Listen, there have been teachers before Jesus. There have been teachers after Jesus. They killed teachers before Jesus. and They killed Je teachers after Jesus. He taught, but he not only taught, he came and put you on his shoulders. He's the only one that did. He's the only one that would. He's the only one that could. So it constantly shows us what? That you contribute nothing to your salvation. Amen. Remember I told you, those sheep run about to and fro. You got to grab them. Once you finally grab them, you got to throw them down, shock them a little bit. It stuns them. While they're stunned, you tie them up. Because if you give them over to their own devices, they're going to fight you tooth and nail. Even though they're lost, even though you're the shepherd and know the way, they'd rather have their own way. Amen. It is to the glory of God that you are here today. It is to the glory of God that you can say Jesus Christ is Lord. Yeah. It is to the glory of God that you have your wits about you despite where you've been and what you've done because Jesus came and thoroughly rescued you. Yeah. He couldn't leave you to your own devices. Amen. You needed a Savior that would do what you should have done, that would live the life you should have lived, and that would die the death that you should die. See, Jesus didn't just die on the cross. He also lived the life that you should live. So yes, we follow his teachings. Don't get me wrong. We need his teachings. But if he's not your savior, his teachings won't help you. Because you're too dumb to get back home. So sinners have to recognize we've been saved by the sheer grace of God. The unmerited favor of God. The reaching out of God to come and get some creature that was created by him and for him. But that has chosen and reduced its relationship to him as to, you're my cosmic bellhop. When I want you, I'll ring. Other than that, leave me to my own devices, leave me to my own schedule. I want to do what I want to do. And when I need you, I'll call you. That's at the heart of human man. Mike, you preach once. I heard you doing your testimony. I'm like, he's preaching my sermon, which is a blessing. That's the Holy Spirit. It is nothing but God that comes. You contribute nothing to becoming a child of God. Amen. Nothing. We move to the search. The context for all the parables is found in verses 1 and 2. The reason for all three of these parables is in 1 and 2. The tax collectors and sinners are gathering. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law mutter. Listen to what they say. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, today's time, it doesn't mean what it meant then. Very rarely would we call some homeless person into our home today. We just, we just wouldn't. Um, but in Jesus' time, when you welcomed anybody into your home, you were establishing two things. One, you were establishing friendship. Two, you were establishing community. You were saying, I want that person or those persons to be a part of me, and I want to be a part of them. That's why the Pharisees had a problem with Jesus, because it dumbfounded them. Because if he's a religious man preaching a religion of a faith community, how can he be including people who have always been excluded? And the reason they're excluded is because if we're going to build a community that's faith-based, then it's got to be based on the principles of God, which means if it's based on the principles of God, we got to have people who are willing to obey the principles of God, and these people are doing everything but obeying the principles of God. So why would you want to eat with them? Why would you want to include them? Who are they that you should even bring them in? And Jesus says, you don't get it. I came just for them. Because you, if you're saved, were once them. You say, well, I've never been on the court.
corner slinging. I've never been on the corner selling. I've never been on the corner whatever. You didn't have to be on the corner, but you were somewhere thinking something, saying something, doing something. Or you were somewhere not thinking something, not saying something, not doing either sin of commission or sin of omission, but somewhere in the line, you were on that corner, if you will. And Jesus came just for you. Jesus says, I want to create a new kind of community that the world has never seen. Listen, Jesus says, I come from a community that cherishes more one sinner that repents than the ones that think this stuff is so right and tight that they don't have to do anything. Amen. Amen. Let's keep your Bible open. Let's go to it. Look what he says. When he gives the parable, look what he says. Verse 7. I tell you that in the same way there will be rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Go to verse 10. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus is telling them, he says, look, I come from a community that all they do is rejoice over somebody getting saved, somebody finding their way home. He says, I didn't come for those that think they're already home. He said, and if you have found your way home, it's only because I brought you home. But don't think you're better than anybody because you made it home. And if you haven't made it home and think you're home, you're worse than the one who knows he's not home. Amen. Amen. The hardest people in church to reach are not the ones that are sinners and tax collectors, but the ones that come to church that think they're Pharisees and teachers of the law. Amen. The hardest ones to get converted are the ones that think their stuff don't stink. See, the sinners and tax collectors know they're a mess, so they come to Jesus. The others don't come except to mutter. I, don't look at me. Why did you come to church today? I, I won't look at you. These parables are a response to the objections of the mutterers. The parables are not to the tax collectors and the sinners. What they're getting out of it is being with Jesus. And so Jesus is comforting them, but the actual sting of the parable is to those that mutter. And it's not to condemn them, it's to hopefully change them. The community in heaven celebrates sinners saved by grace. And the joy that comes from that community is what motivates salvation. Look, there's one word that keeps coming up in this parable, in these first two parables. And it's not really a word, it's the form of the word. It says, joyfully, rejoice, rejoice, then I rejoice. There's a joy that comes out of this community. That's got, let, let, me, let, me, let me do it this way. Most of us, as human beings, before Christ, if we've accomplished something, there's a joy that comes in that. Amen. Uh, let, let me just pick on my niece. She graduated from college. Now, she's saved, but let me just pick on her for the example. She graduated from college. She went through school. She, she endured. She, she endeavored. She, she, she sacrificed. She, she pursued. And she, and she overcame. She got her degree. For the world, the world says, wow, okay, because I've done that, my identity is my degree. My identity is the flashy car. My identity is the house I live in. My identity is the Ivy League school. My identity is the neighborhood I grew up in. My identity is what kind of clothes I wear. My, listen, your identity is formed by one of two things. In fact, it's a combination of both. What you think of yourself and what you perceive others to think of you. That's what built your identity. You are who you are because mommy and daddy told you who you were. That's why parents, be careful what you tell your kids. You ain't nothing. You ain't nothing. You ain't, you ain't gonna never be nothing. Your daddy wasn't nothing and your mama wasn't nothing. That forms identity. So be careful what you form. 
But my point is, you are, your identity is formed by what you think of you and what you perceive others to think of you. So what happens is, whenever you've earned something or you've accomplished something, you think that makes you who you are. The problem with that as a sinner is that it tends to make you think you're superior to somebody. So you look at the person that doesn't have the degree, and you say, I'm better. You may not say it. You look at the person, and you're driving the Benzo, and they're driving the Hoopty, and you say, I'm okay. Now, that kind of joy is a dangerous joy. One, it doesn't last. And two, it doesn't lend itself to create a community because it excludes people. And Christians are not to exclude anyone. Let me define for you what's a community. A community is a group of individuals who have been bonded into a body through an intense common experience. A group of individuals who've been bonded into a body through an intense common experience. I do a lot of History Channel stuff. Columbine, after that massacre, they are a tight-knit community because they went through a traumatic, intense experience that, did, that whether you were black, white, yeah. Protestant, Catholic, you came through it and it bonded you. So your community, listen, the stronger or the more intense the experience, the stronger the bond. The stronger the bond, the stronger the community. What I'm saying to you is this. Jesus comes into your life to create a new community. He says, your first identity is no longer your car or your degree. Your first identity is that you're Christian. Yes. Amen. Amen. Then we can follow with gender and class and all those have their place, but not first. You should never identify yourself first as a female Amen. or male. As married or single. Not first. Not first. Because this community is about a community that's based in Jesus. Therefore, the key to your identity is that you are Christ. And he said, well, it's hard and I'm not quite there. And I get that. None of us are quite there. That's, that's the road you should be on. As sheep, we've got to follow the shepherd because we've got to recognize in order to create a bond with people that have the same thing in common. See, I, I, I'm African-American male, uh, early 50s, uh, over six foot. All those things can describe me. Dark skin uh, from the Northeast. You can send me over to the Ukraine to a 105 year old woman and if we can get a language translated and we can start talking about Jesus despite our differences we will create community because the intense thing that we have together is this we were both once dead but because of Jesus we are now both alive and so the one thing that joins us is greater than the differences that separate us. Amen. As the church, we've got to stop thinking of black church, Amen. white church, Amen. females only. No, no, no. It's the body, and, and a community is a group of individuals that are bonded together in one body by a, an intense common experience. What's your intense common experience? Jesus. Amen. You should be able to relate to one another and share with one another what you go through as Christian first. Amen. Take nothing away from you being from the South. Take nothing away from you being masculine. Take nothing away from you being military. That's all fine and dandy later on. But the first thing you need to identify with is this my sister or brother. And if it isn't, then let me share something that enables him or her to become my sister or brother. Yes. When you start to feed on the word of God and the gospel changes you to understand, to really, really understand that you were once dead. Ephesians chapter 2 starts off and says, you who were once dead in trespasses and sin, now he's made you, he's quickened you, he's brought you to life. You who used to live a certain way, he's changed you. You go down to verse 8 and 9, he says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself, that is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his word, we should create in Christ Jesus. You come on down to the end, he says, you've been fitly joined together, you are stones, you are living stones in the temple. Come on now. Go to, go to, 
First Kings, y'all still with me? Yes, sir. Go to First Kings. I'm going to get you out of here. I, I smell the chicken. First Kings, chapter 6. I, I got to get to the chicken smell. First Kings, you got to look at your table of contents. That's all right. You do that. First Kings, chapter 6. And while you're looking, look up Ephesians chapter 2, because we're going to go right there on the heels of this. Chapter 6, 1 Kings, verse 7, and then we get, get Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21. So one's Old Testament, one's New Testament. I'll wait, because I want you to be there. If you got 1 Kings, say amen. amen. If you got Ephesians, say amen. amen. Nah, it's less. It's okay, keep going. I want you there. The chicken will wait. All of you were just about there for the first one. What about Ephesians? Are we there? Okay, look. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7. In building the temple, only blocks dressed at the quarry were used, and no hammer, chisel, or any other iron tool was heard at the temple site while it was being built. Let me do King James for you. And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. Let me explain to you real quick what that's about. That's the building of Solomon's temple. David wanted to build the temple. God said, you can't build the temple. You got too much blood on your hands. But I want my temple built. I'm going to give it to your son Solomon, for he's the wisest man on the planet. And I want him to do it a certain way. And so he prescribed for Solomon exactly what materials to use, how and the dimensions of the building, what it was going to be. Why? Because the temple was the place where mankind, in particular the Jews, could come and meet God. You can't see God. You can't taste him. But when you went to the temple, you were in the presence of Almighty God. He reigned in the Holy of Holies. And though you couldn't get in there, you sent a representative in that could mediate between you and that God that you couldn't get to. That priest had to be right in order to go in. But nonetheless, he was a man anointed of God to be able to represent both. So when he built the temple, they get stones. The stones were cut so perfectly by the And they didn't have what we have now. But the stones were cut so perfectly that when they went to go build the temple, they didn't even have to hammer or chisel or saw. The stones could fit. Perfectly in place because they have been cut out perfectly. Amen. Amen. That's why the Bible says when the temple was built, there was silence. Everybody knows Ernie's building this right now. Every now and then, ah, it's not quite right. Take it down, cut off a little bit more. Every now and then, no, take that screw out, put it up a little higher. The stones were cut so perfectly that you didn't need mortar or anything because they slid right in the place. Flushly. Why? Because they were formed that they might what? Build the place where God would dwell. Go to Ephesians. Y'all still with me? Go to Ephesians. I'm going to get y'all out of here. Go to Ephesians 2. Verse 21. I'm going to start at 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Listen, in whom the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You say, well, listen, I, I, listen, I have a problem with white folks, and I have a problem with gay and lesbian. I get all that. I get all that. God has to still cut on you a little bit. God has to still chisel you, because you know what? You ain't no better than them. And God is cutting on you so that he can form, listen, so that you can become a living stone. See, the Old Testament were stone stones. God wants to make you a living stone because he doesn't live in mortar and clay. He wants to live in flesh and bone. And so he now makes his abode not in a temple. He doesn't dwell in here. He dwells in here. Amen. So now he wants to cut 
about you so perfectly that you've deadly joined. Whether you're black, whether you're Ukrainian, whether you're white, whether you're Spanish, whether you're military, whether you're civilian, it doesn't matter. He wants to cut you perfectly because he wants his community to be fitly joined together. That's a unique community. You'll never see a community like that on the face of the planet. You've never seen one before, and you'll never see one later. Because the only one that has the ability to do that is Jesus. Not only are you infinitely lost before Jesus, but you're infinitely loved. Listen, listen. There's three parables. There's the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. In the first two, the person leaves the majority to find the minority. If we're having a party and one person leaves the party, you say, see? <laughs> Bye. Unless they've got something that we want to part. In this case, the sheep is just as valuable as the 99 in the party, and the shepherd leaves the 99 to get the one. The woman turns her house upside down. She's got nine other coins. She had ten. She wants the one. I need you to understand that as infinitely lost as you once were without Jesus, at the same time you were infinitely loved. You are his treasure. Even when you didn't act like treasure. Even when you were lost and he whistled and you wouldn't come and he'd come to get, get you and you'd run away. You were still his treasure. So much so that he came after you. So much so that he left those that would stay, stand still and listen. I need you to get that because sometimes we come to church and we don't have a climate and a community that allows us to recognize that even in our fallen state, even in our strained state, Jesus is still coming after you. And that, and that, each other should be supporting Jesus and coming after you. Amen. Amen. Quiet on that one. Thank you, my sisters. Thank you. <laughs> this joy, and we ended up with, this, with the search. This joy is a joy that includes everyone. It's not a, it's not a joy that excludes. The joy of heaven includes. Amen. Amen. The joy you got from being status quo in this world doesn't include. It excludes. You have parties, you don't invite certain people. Come on now. Even if you could, you don't. But the joy that comes with this new community says, all are welcome. Yeah, I know he don't smell right. Let him come on. I, I, I know his mouth's a little raggedy. I, I get that. We're going to work on that, but let him come. <laughs> because but for the grace. The joy keeps you from looking down your nose at the people outside, and it create, creates a unique bond for the people with you on the inside. Amen. Amen. We go to the shepherd, it's real quick. Shepherds don't consult with sheep. That's right. <laughs> shepherds don't consult with sheep. That's right. Shepherds don't get their sheep together and say, listen, what do you think about if we go through that path? Now, it's got some briars on it, but what do you think about that? And the sheep say, well, I don't know. All right, well, let's have a consensus vote. No, shepherds don't consult. Shepherds lead. And sheep follow or they get lost. Now you say, Pastor, that's a hard thing. And you know what it is? To relinquish your power is a hard thing. To give, not even for you to give up yourself and follow your shepherd, it gets a little tight. I know it does for me. Because we want power. We, we want to be able to control. We want to be able to feel like, I got this. But if you're going to be a sheep, you've got to yield to your shepherd. Amen. And Jesus knows that it's a hard thing for you to do. And this is what he does. And we ended up. In the Old Testament, there was a feast called Passover. Passover was the night in which the exodus of the Jews began leaving Egypt, going, into, going toward the promised land. They were instructed to take a lamb to prep it, to inspect it, kill it, to do certain things with its blood, to do certain things with the meat, to do certain things with the bread, and to do certain things with the wine. 
And so their salvation was contingent on how they followed the directions. If they didn't follow the directions, they were not going to be saved that night. They were going to die like every other Egyptian was going to die. After the Passover was over, the Jews for thousands of years, every Passover commemorated that night. They had a Passover feast. And they remembered what Moses and, and their ancestors had done. And they continued to do it. They had lamb, they had wine, and they had bread. Y'all still with me? Yeah. Jesus does the same thing the night before he's betrayed, the night he's betrayed, the night before he dies. He has Passover, but he does something very peculiar. He has the weirdest Passover you've ever seen in life. Because at the table, he, he celebrates the Passover. They have bread. They have wine. But there's no lamb. There's no lamb. They drink the cup. They eat the bread. And there's no lamb on the table. Why? Because you don't need lamb on the table when you got lamb at the table. <laughs> Jesus is the lamb of God. He said all those little lambs were just to point you to here. I am the lamb. So you still got all they had. But now you've got the real lamb. You've got the real wine. And you've got the real bread. Jesus says the reason you can give yourself over Naaman and myself and Stanley Morgan and Leslie, you can give yourself over. The reason you can trust me as shepherd is because I'm the only shepherd that was willing to become a sheep. I know what it is to be thrown down because my father threw me down. Oh, y'all ain't catching it. See, he didn't throw me down because I was a mess, but he threw me down because of you. So I let him throw me down and he tied me up. And he put me on the cross. And now, because I was tied up for you, I can throw you down. Tie you up. Put you over my shoulder. And see, listen, if the shepherd doesn't carry the sheep home, the sheep doesn't get home. Remember, you're not cats and dogs. Nowhere along the line can the shepherd say, okay, we're almost home. Go ahead. That sheep's going to go just like this. The shepherd knows he has the responsibility of carrying that sheep for the rest of its life or the sheep will never make it home. And Jesus is the only shepherd. The only shepherd that will carry you all the way home. Never drop you. Never stop. Right. But get you where you got to go. He doesn't get tired. And he counts it a privilege to carry you. And then there's two things you got to do in order to let grace change us individually and build this community in us. One, commit yourself to building a community that's filled with beautiful, unified difference. I'll say it again. You got to create a community, not just church, not just church. You got to create a community. It's going to start with you. You got to create a community around you that's built with beautiful, unified difference. Well, how can it be unified differently? No, that's, that's the whole point. It's different that come together as one. I, I, I'm an old movie guy. I, I like the Dirty Dozen. I like the Dirty Dozen. The old one, Lee Marvin. Lee Marvin says, I got, give me 12 cats and we'll do this mission. And see, you know, these guys are derelicts, they're rapists, they're murderers, they're thieves, they're, they're a little bit of everything. They're different. He says, yeah, but if I can get them to understand the goal, then I can unify them even in their difference. So you've got to create a community that's built up of people that look differently than you. Act differently than you. Talk differently than you. But the one thing that makes you common is the intense common experience of Jesus Christ. And for those that are outside of it, you, that's the second point. You've got to commit yourself to building a community where sinners are free to admit they're sinners. Amen. Amen. See, your community won't grow if you don't, if somebody walks in here, he knows he's a sinner, she knows she's a sinner, but she doesn't feel free enough to come in because she thinks this might be where the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers live, then she ain't free enough to come into the community because the community is too good for her. Oh, 
So you've got to commit yourself to building a unified, different community, community but you've also got to build a community that allows freedom for those, even after saved, that are messed up. She dropped the ball. I, yes, I, yes, I dropped the ball. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. I don't condone you dropping the ball. I love you anyway. Let me help you pick up the ball. Amen. That's the community of heaven. That's where they rejoice. And Jesus says, I want that same rejoicing on earth. Grace is why you're here. Grace is what they need. Let the grace that brought you in draw them in. Create your community in church. Create your community in home. Create your community on your job. Create your community in school. Create your community where you go so that people can admit their sinners. Amen. Come in. Become a living stone. Be cut perfectly to fit. I know that's right. And God get the glory. Yes. Yes. I'm done. Let us pray. Yes. Father, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that despite who we are, you are who you are in us. We thank you that you love us enough to come and get us. That even when we stumble and fall, even when we're distracted and stray, you constantly rescue us. That you've pulled us out of the muck and the mire. That you clean us up and you're constantly cleaning us up. Lord, that's not an excuse. We need to turn from sin and turn to you. Our righteousness is only in you. We recognize that, Father. So we don't want to just follow Jesus' example. We want to have it be in us that we might follow it, not just see it, but that it become real to us, that we recognize we know better than anybody else. But it's because of you is our identity. It is because of you we have a new self, a new self-image, a new image that we can live in this community. Bless us now. Bless those, Lord, that you want to bring in. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. If there's one today and you're unsaved, I just can't make it without you. I just can't make it without you.